topic is about citizen science in outreach and education. And our speakers, Harold from the Netherlands and from the United States. Our first speaker is Sandra De Vries. She is the founder of Pulse Aqua, uh, which is she is working to advise uh, how to implement citizen science to solve issues in water, environment, and the climate sector with her company, Pulse Aqua. Uh, she uses her background in hydrology and water resource management in this effort. And she has, among others, she's implemented this for outreach and education in different projects, and she will highlight these for us in her presentation. So I'm going to turn it to Sandra. Thank you very much, Chris and Tom, for inviting me. And um, let me try and share my screen then, because it might take some time before it starts working. Um, oh, I think it goes faster now. Um, can you all see it? Yep, looks good. Okay, one moment. I need to wait until. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, I think, in principle, you said it all about me. Um, so I'm gonna immediately continue. I'm gonna tell a little bit about Polsaqua, uh, because indeed that I started that four years ago. I, I got into citizen science earlier and got so enthusiastic that. I realized that we need much more people that can advise on how to implement citizen science um, and yeah, how to do that, especially in the water sector where I've been well studying, but also working in. Um, and uh, I think in principle, I, my, my motto is really that if you, if you are able to implement the methodology well, then, then it is a very uh, useful methodology for many different things, among others, the topic that we're uh, going to discuss today. Um, <laughs> so when uh, Tom and Chris invited me to do this, I, I, I really had like the first question was, what are we actually talking about? Because for me, uh, citizen science and education and outreach, yeah, there is, well, there's quite some, some options because it has a lot to do with uh, three different options. Uh, well, you can talk about within education and outreach, citizen science within it. Or are we talking about education and outreach for citizen science? Or are we even talking about um, something else, meaning education and outreach within or for citizen science projects? Uh, because all of them are really important. Um, but since uh, no, the answer from Tom and uh, Chris was definitely to focus on the first, I will do that. Um, and as Chris said already, I will do that via projects. Um, but as you can see here, I, I kind of changed the outreach part because I, I, I sort of disagree with it. In my opinion, it should be citizen science within, within education and awareness raising. Um, or maybe I'm wrong and I just misunderstood it, but. Uh, um, that's how I see it more, and I will explain a little bit more in the projects that I'm going to show you. Um, I chose three projects that I've been working on that actually have to do a lot with education and awareness raising. Um, and I think that they will help us. But before I do that, um, I would like to well go into some definitions and questions that uh, came up uh, for me when I started thinking about this topic. Um, first of all, definition, I don't want to define citizen science. Um, not sure what was discussed the last time, but yeah, there are many definitions. Just want to make sure that you guys have in mind how I at least see it. Um, because for me, at least you should have an active participation, meaning I'm not talking about crowdsourcing or using data from Twitter or um, so I, I really talk about citizen science where um, the citizens have an active um, acknowledged participation that can be a very small one just having a installing a sensor in the house but at least being aware that they are actually adding to something um, I also believe that it, really part a big part is to really use scientific methods so really using the scientific process 
to do the research. Um, and the end goal should be to answer a question. I mean, there can be a lot of side goals, so uh, side products, you could call it, like education and awareness. But for me, that is always the way I, I, I work towards uh, citizen science. Otherwise, I prefer to just call it education or awareness raising, while citizen science is, well, it's like saying that a cow is an animal, but an animal is not a cow, no? So, uh, yeah, just want to make that differentiation. Um, also, very important part is uh, when you talk about citizen scientists, then make sure that you never use them, but you work together with them. So that's also something that we'll come back to on, on the, the educational part. And yeah, of course, if you're talking about school children or students, then they are the citizen scientists, they're your target audience. Um, but yeah, then uh, coming up to the questions, then you start thinking, is it bottom up or top down? Because all the projects that I'm going to talk about will be top down projects, meaning that they are projects organized either by a scientific or um, or a sort of more, well, what, let's say it's, um, yeah, at least a research perspective. Um, but you can also have educational citizen science projects that are created bottom up. Um, so I'm not talking about that at this moment, but I think they are very important. Um, also, when is it a success? When is it citizen science? There's a big discussion, and I think especially in educational contexts, you should be aware that, well, maybe, for example, you cannot create uh, the, the, the scientific papers that you might want to reach. Uh, is it then still science? Is it then still citizen science? Um, when do you call implementing citizen science within education and awareness raising a success? Um, well, maybe we can answer it after the project, but uh, it's a big question. And uh, also, yeah, as I said, data collection, is it the, the end goal or is it a means for education? I think you should really start, start uh, asking yourself these questions when you're working with citizen science in educational perspective. Um, because in my opinion, with every citizen science project, there is education. Um, but uh, then it's more a means to get, for example, data collected or a research question app answered. But if you want to also use it within official or more official educational processes, then you are talking about a completely different thing. Um, so then I want to come back uh, to the project. So the first project I want to talk about, or at least highlight a little bit, is the project that actually made me get to know citizen science. Um, so when I started, I just finished uh, my master's, um, actually with Tom, uh, partly, and um, I realized that I didn't know what, to, what I wanted to do. So I started working at the TU Delft for a couple of days a week. Um, and I got an assignment to analyze some data that was collected with three primary schools in this in the city that I was studying. Um, and um, <laughs> they were uh, these these primary schools had been asked to take manual measurements of rainfall, a uh, daily daily manual uh, measurements, um, and their data should have been validated by uh, weather stations that were placed in those schools. So um, <laughs> the funny thing was they were asking me to analyze the data um, without immediately calling it citizen science. But in principle, this was a citizen science project. They were including primary schools to do measurements. And um, I can immediately like, make it easy to, for you. That data was use useless. Um, I found out that there were many holes in the validation data. So actually, almost none of the data had been passed onto the server because uh, the, the weather station didn't send it well, so all the data got lost. Um, and the primary school's measurements were very nonsensical. And then I started interviewing the teachers and what, what did I find out? Well, um, they didn't take a daily measurement as we understand the daily measurement from eight to eight in the morning. Um, well, at least that's how we do it in the Netherlands from eight to eight or from nine to nine. Um, but <laughs> as you can see here on the picture, this was a manual made by the teacher for her kids. 
uh, it's in Dutch, but um, it, it says literally uh, uh, at the first line, like uh, measure at 8.30 in the morning, you bring the measurement device outside and at, uh, well, uh, 1.45 p.m., you bring the measurement device inside again, and that is your daily sum. Um, <laughs> as you can understand, if every school decides about their own daily sum, then you don't really have any, um, well, comparative data. Uh, and things like this, I, I found out while, while working on it, meaning I got in, I fell in love with citizen science because of it. I learned a, a huge amount because of a failed project. Um, and definitely the children learned something because they learned what measuring rainfall is, although they might not have measured it in exactly the correct way. They got to know the topic um, and, and were well, aware of rainfall much more than afterwards. However, there was definitely no uh, useful uh, research results. That's my first uh, encounter with citizen science and also immediately with citizen science in educational context. Um, and then I, uh, I started the project Schools and Satellites actually uh, just before Corona started. Uh, this was in Ghana and uh, we received a grant from the European Space Agency to implement citizen science uh, to answer a research question from this PhD year called uh, Monica Tranes Camarena. Um, and yeah, there's a video that I want to show. Um, and I realize now that I didn't share it well, and that's why probably the videos won't work. So I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to share, stop sharing and do this again. Sorry about that. Okay, there. Now it should work. Um, and if I share it, please tell me if the sound doesn't work. Okay, but um, Monica explains here what, um, well, what the project is about. This project is based in the north of Ghana, West Africa, where over 80% of the population rely on agriculture for a living, and most of it is rainfall. Traditionally, Ghanaian farmers have followed their indigenous knowledge, such as the greening of the baobab trees or the chant of seasonal birds, to know when it was going to rain and so when they should farm. However, climate change is changing natural cycles and shifting rainfall patterns. So farmers don't know when it's going to rain anymore, which often leads to large losses. With a scarce rain distribution and data transmission challenges, satellites seem to be the best option to monitor rainfall. However, existing rainfall satellite products don't perform well in West Africa. At the end, there is no accurate rainfall information. This is where our project Schools and Satellites comes in. We aim to produce a reliable rainfall product for West Africa by combining earth observation, deep learning, and citizen science. The project is funded by the European Space Agency as one of the first pilot projects of the Citizen Science Earth Observation Lab. So, why do satellite rainfall products achieve a poor performance in West Africa? Traditional satellite rainfall products generally rely on the temperature of the top of the clouds that they link to rainfall through some analytical expression and then correct using data from the ground. However, in West Africa, this doesn't work well. Possible reasons are the scarce rain gauges and the condition underneath the clouds. There are more aerosols in the atmosphere and the land surface temperature is higher. That is why we propose a data-driven algorithm that looks at information related to rainfall other than the top cloud temperature, using convolutional neural networks. As other satellite products, it will look at the clouds, using Severi, on board the Meteosat satellite. It will also look at the aerosols, using Tropomi, on board Sentinel-5P, at the land surface temperature, using the SLSTR instrument, on board Sentinel-3, and at soil moisture-related radar data, taken by the CISA radar on board Sentinel-1. Additionally, it will use topographic information in the form of a digital elevation model and multispectral imagery taken by the multispectral instrument on board Sentinel-2. To combine all these products, we have created a data cube for Northern Ghana, in which the products can be thought of as different layers.
To create it, we have used the Open Data Cube and PostgreSQL to manage the database. Once in the data cube, the products can be searched for by location, date, and dimensions and resolution of the desired output. For example, this is a Sentinel-5 aerosol product extracted from the data cube. The Rain Runner Rainfall Retrieval algorithm will operate from the data cube. First, it will crop subcubes of 30 by 30 kilometers and estimate the rainfall for their centers in two steps. First, a convolutional neural network will do a binary classification in rain, no rain. Then, a second convolutional neural network will estimate rainfall amount. Now, where do we get the training and validation data from? With machine learning being increasingly applied in Earth observation, this is a recurrent question. Our answer is citizen science. To complement the existing rain gauge network, we are working with high school students and farmers that are measuring daily rainfall all across the north of Ghana. For this, we are using the methodology developed by Smartphones for Water, in which rain gauges are made from plastic bottles. The citizen scientist take a daily rainfall measurement and a photo of the gauge and submit them using the ODK Collect app. Then the data is stored in the Smartphones for Water server. Due to the importance of agriculture in northern Ghana, where most citizens are also farmers, the project is having a great success and many volunteers are joining us. Together, we hope to contribute towards food security in West Africa. Okay. Um, yes, so if you understand well, um, this project was, uh, of course, having some problems because of Corona, but we extended it another year and we could, well, collect actually quite some data. Um, what I want to show you is uh, how some of the teachers responded at the end of the project. So that's a very short. My name is Kasim Sule a teacher at Tutko Demonstration Basic School, uh, situated in Upper West Region, Sisala East Pacific. And uh, my experience with schools and satellite projects has been enormous. I think it gave me the opportunity to collect data with my students and we were able to monitor the rainfall pattern in the area and because of the practical feel of it I got more aware of the rainfall pattern of the area and going forward the students are eager to have more opportunities to participate in the project so that they can become informed citizens of climate change and become ambassadors of climate change as well. <clears throat> My name is Isaac Said Nengo a teacher at Stadium Residential Business School in Tumusala East in the Upper West Region of Ghana. I think so far with the program Schools and Satellites, it has been a good lesson for us. I've learned a lot about the rain fall pattern measurement and all that and I think my students too have also learned a whole lot with regard to that. So in further going on I wish Sandra, uh if you could wrap up in a couple seconds, thanks. Yeah I will. Okay, so this is another example. Um, this project is based in the north of Ghana, West Africa. My name is um the last example is all schools unite. And uh, I'm not going to show the video, uh, but the idea is that um, uh, it's actually a project with primary schools in the Netherlands. Uh, and you do this yearly and every year they choose a different um, research. Um, so I, I organized it several times and organizing it this year again. But the idea is to um, yeah, implement science within the primary schools and at the same time help uh, with research in those universities in the Netherlands. Um, and what I think, sorry about that, yes. What I think is interesting about these uh, different projects is that um, every time again, you see that it's very hard to combine education and actual data collection um, to make it useful for research because 
programs um, of, 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 of education often actually, well, they don't always coincide. So you have to really uh, consider um, what you what your end goal is um, and and do you do you find it more important that there is data collected that is completely valuable and that you can really use for your research or is it okay that well maybe it won't succeed um, and that might be a bit of a, a, a bad um, uh, I don't know if it's not such a good um, uh, end, end result for some people here, but uh, I think it's important to keep it in mind that it's really hard. Um, also, teachers or students, who is your audience? Keep it in mind because you saw also with the Schools and Satellites project that actually in the end we work mostly with the teachers, not with the students. Um, and the teachers, yeah, they can also just decide to do it themselves, that to not include the, the, the students so much. But if they do, then you can see that there is quite some um, awareness raising as well and educational value. Um, I wanted to go a little bit more into the other questions, but um, I think uh, very important to be aware that it's hard and um, that it's also not so easy to know uh, what, what you should find more important, education, awareness raising, or indeed the research aspect of citizen science and education. Um, and yeah, just to show you a little bit more for the different one, the education and outreach for citizen science, just in case you're interested to know with more, there's an open science uh, MOOC that I've helped uh, build uh, where one module is actually going into citizen science. And there is a, a podcast that I'm uh, at, well, that I'm actually uh, hosting that's called the Science Citizens Podcast. And uh, well, I also tell about the projects that I organize, among others, for example, the Schools and Satellites Project. So if you're interested, then just look it up on the Spotify. Um, thank you very much. I will share the presentation slides later with the hosts. So in case that you guys want to find these websites, um, then you are more than welcome, of course. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sandra, for sharing that. We're going to hold questions until after our next uh, two speakers. So let me quickly introduce our next speaker. Ashley Eaton, she uses she, her pronouns. Ashley is the Watershed and Lake Education Coordinator uh, for Watershed Alliance, which is part of Lake Champlain Sea Grant and the University of Vermont Extension. Uh, Ashley uh, coordinates this program and professional science uh, development opportunities for kindergarten to 12th grade teachers, as well as an undergraduate internship program associated with this youth education program. Uh, she has a master's in natural resources from the University of Vermont and is a doctoral student uh, studying this program. I will turn it to you, Ashley. Great. Thanks, Chris. I will pull up my screen. Okay. Can you see that? Does that look okay? Yep. Looks great. Okay. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, as Chris shared, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the Watershed Alliance program and then one of our educational efforts that is focused on citizen science um, and stream monitoring. Um, and this project is a collaboration between the University of Vermont Extension and the State University of Plattsburgh and is situated within Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Um, so um, I know that folks are joining from across the globe. And so I just wanted to give you a little context to place. So the program um, that I coordinate is located in the northeastern United States um, and crosses state boundaries across Vermont and upstate New York. And this map on the screen right now is showing this transboundary watershed um, of Lake Champlain, which is the watershed in which I work, um, which includes a southern kind of little piece here um, of Canada. So the Watershed Alliance program, I wanted to share a little bit about the educational model that we use because I think that's really um, important context to understand how this program is implemented and what makes it so successful. Um, so Watershed Alliance works with three primary audiences, K-12 teachers, 
K-12 students and undergraduate students. Um, and the goal of the program really is to increase environmental literacy and awareness of local water quality issues um, related to the watershed in which we work, um, Lake Champlain. And so the program is over 20 years old. Um, and in that time span, um, this data looks specifically at 2011 to 2023, we've reached over 15,000 students, 600 K-12 teachers, and um, about 65 schools out of the 250 in our watershed. And we've had over 60 undergraduate interns. So that gives you a sense of the programmatic reach. And we're really aimed at connecting students to their place and answering this question around um, how healthy is my local stream reach. So within Watershed Alliance, we have kind of three core programs. The program that I'm going to be talking about today is our stream monitoring and stewardship program, um, and that is our community science based program. And this is our flagship program. So our program actually started with this stream monitoring piece, the citizen science um, component, and this really has been the strongest out of all of our educational offerings. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk you through what that program looks like in the field. So one unique facet of how we implement this program in the field is that a lot of our programming is taught or facilitated by undergraduate students. Um, and so these are undergraduate students both at the University of Vermont, but also um, other colleges throughout our watershed. Um, and so these students receive training on the kind of the program, how to implement it, watershed science basics, um, and then also kind of uh, education 101, how to work with students in the field around safety and um, behavioral management and things like that. So this really allows us to extend our program to more schools and expand our geographic reach by having these extra hands um, and folks that are interested in exploring this as a professional career um, to be able to reach different um, kind of communities outside of our um, university community here in Burlington, which is our largest city. So stream monitoring and stewardship um, is broken into kind of five different parts. Um, it's a five part lesson series. The way that this is implemented is through actually formal education. So we are going into K-12 classrooms and implementing this project in collaboration with the teacher. Um, so one of the key pieces of this is that our teachers that participate in this program with us usually before we go into the classroom have taken a training course with us and we use a train the trainer model and the goal of this really is to help ensure that teachers are um, kind of understanding the content that's going to be implemented um, that they're confident to assist in the field when we're engaging in our um, field stations and that they are able to integrate this into their curriculum beyond the um, kind of five parts that you see here. Um, so in order to get students prepared, we usually begin the lesson series with the watershed model, which is an enviroscape tabletop model that allows for students to start thinking more broadly about point and non-point source pollutants. Um, and so they're starting to make connections between what's happening in their local community and what might be some environmental factors that are implementing their um, stream reach. The next um, lesson in that series is exploration stations, and this is really field preparation. So we're getting students comfortable with the monitoring equipment that we're going to be using, and we're kind of trying to make it so the students are prepared when we get into the field, um, when there are more variables and more things um, happening in a new space to them that they're prepared with the knowledge and the skills that they have. So both of those lessons, one and two, happen in the classroom. And then lesson three is our stream monitoring field day. And this, the way that this is implemented really depends on the teacher. So sometimes we will um, do focus on one parameter one day and then another parameter another day. It just depends on the timing of the class sessions and how close to the school, the, the proximity of the stream reach. Um, and so in that, I'm going to talk about how we implement that field piece in just a minute. Um, but just to wrap up this five lesson sequence, the last um, piece that happens in the classroom is a data analysis um, where students take the data they gather in the stream, they bring it back to the classroom, and then they try to, they do averages and they make meaning from that, and they use that data to help inform a stewardship project. So our schools that have capacity, we really encourage them to take the data and then implement a project in that stream reach um, that would improve water quality. So that could look like a rip riparian restoration. Um, some of our urban schools do a lot of trash removal, things like that. Um, okay, 
so next up this let's dive in here so the stream monitoring and stewardship program is um a really unique program for students to basically practice being stream ecologists and so i kind of mentioned a couple facets around the quality control and quality assurance so we're training the teachers in advance all of our undergrads are trained and then our staff are trained as well and so we are there facilitating this program and basically how that kind of looks day of is we show up to the stream site um, that we've pre-selected with the teacher we set up three stations so we're going to monitor biological chemical and physical um, parameters and um, basically the students get to rotate through those stations engage in collecting data um, and then at the end of that they have basically a class data set that provides a really nice snapshot um, of that stream for that um, time period. So uh, just a little note, I'm going to talk about the three parameters in a little bit more depth, but chemical really is a snapshot of what's happening in the moment. That's kind of how we describe it to the students. The biological station explores life in the stream, which provides a little bit more insight into what organisms can survive and thrive over longer periods of time. And then the physical assessment is really starting to look at that overall stream health and um, what types of habitat um, and other environmental factors like kind of external to the stream um, how those may be impacting it and then we have the students weave basically all three of those stations together to get a better understanding of of the overall stream health so the first station our biological station this is focused on benthic macroinvertebrates so small organisms that are living either their full life cycle or part of their life cycle in the stream. And so you can see in the bottom right corner of the PowerPoint here, we have a little um, stonefly. And you can see the students on the screen are using the KickNet method for um, collection. So something that's really kind of key to the program is that the way that the data is collected, it's collected in the same way each time. And so I put a little snapshot of our biological um, data assessment here. And so this is kind of showing how we calculate the index value and this is we have three tiers of the program so think about beginner intermediate and advanced um, this is from our advanced group so students will be kind of looking at not only collecting but identifying and then within that categorizing them based on their sensitivity and so this is how they're going to be able to quantify the organisms that they're finding in the stream um, and so it is the three kind of levels of the data sets allow you to modify for each group to make sure that what you're delivering in terms of the content is developmentally appropriate. So from there, if we go to the physical station, um, we're measuring pieces of um, the external stream site like a uh, canopy cover. So this photo here is my colleague Caroline, and she's leading an exercise with a group of teachers, and she is having them use their arms to measure the percentage of canopy cover over the stream. Um, and then a few other factors that um, get assessed at this station are things like embeddedness of the um, stream bank um, of the stream composition, looking at the velocity and transparency. Um, so those are a few of the metrics that are getting measured there that really kind of focus on the types of habitat um, in the riparian area. And then lastly, I'm going to talk that we get a couple slides on the chemical station because we recently changed um, how we implement this station. So our chemical station is collecting data on temperature, pH, orthophosphate and dissolved oxygen. And you can kind of see on our data sheet here, the students are conducting um, trials if there is enough time. If not, each group is at least getting one trial and then they have the class data set to average. Um, and then we have at the top of that data sheet some healthy ranges that we can expect for our region. Um, so the photo on the right here is showing um, this again is a group of teachers and they are running a titration to measure dissolved oxygen. So they are um, working through that using a Hawk kit that actually is our um, old methodology. We recently just switched to some new probes that I want to talk to you about because these have really been revolutionary with the previous system. As you see here, we're generating waste, which is um, something that is difficult to manage in the field and then also just not as sustainable um, over time. So we changed our methods recently to using these vernier um, probes. And so this has been pretty revolutionary because it allows us to get higher frequency data in the field um, with students. 
and it allows us to do more um, with that data once we get it. So um, you can see there are some teachers here on the left. They are using an iPad. So these probes using a Bluetooth connection connect and are pulling real time data um, in. And then um, I'm going to show you on the next slide here. So it's pulling it into a graph called Graphically. And so through this app, you're actually able to manipulate the data. Um, and organize the data in a CSV file, which makes it really easy to um, export and share and manipulate after the fact. So this um, this was a shift in the way that we had been doing things in our protocols, but it has been pretty revolutionary because it has really improved the quality of the data that we're getting for these chemical parameters and eliminated some of the um, kind of challenges to the data that we had previously been getting. Okay, a few more slides here. So. The last piece is really once we have the data from the field, um, it's working with the students to make the data meaningful. So um, the students end up with a class data set that they can work through. That also gets entered into a database that Lake Champlain Sea Grant manages um, and that schools can share and look at one another's data. Um, the As I said again, the Vernier methods have really um, improved the validity of our data and allowing us to get higher frequency data that could be used um, for potentially more rigorous research projects. And then the last piece is really trying to get the students to put into action what they've learned from monitoring their stream site. Um, so through that data collection, through analyzing that data collection, the data, and then interpreting that, they're able to design um, a student-led project that improves water quality. And so um, that's something that we're trying to work on right now is getting more schools to that step of implementation of their stewardship project. The last piece that I just want to mention, so um, I shared a little bit with you about the methods that we use and um, how we implement this in the field. Our team right now for 2023, we're working on, this is the cover of a stream monitoring and stewardship handbook that we are putting together to kind of codify the methods that we use um, to be able to share with our teachers and our partners, um, but also to be a model for other programs that are interested in engaging in citizen science stream monitoring, um, specifically with youth. So be on the lookout for that. I will put my email in the chat box. So if you have any, um, if you want to be notified when this is out, um, I'd be happy to share that. And then I just want to say thanks so much to everyone for listening, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks so much, Ashley. We want to move into our pop-up speaker before we open the call for questions, just to make sure we don't uh, over overstep. So I'm going to immediately share uh, and introduce uh, Dr. Farrell Adam, who is with the um, Water Can in South Africa, and who will share with us uh, information about a citizen science drinking water test kit. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, where I am, it's good evening, so sorry if I'm just saying that. I'm going to share my screen quickly. Okay, so thank you for allowing me to have a quick presentation. Um, I work for an organization called WaterCan, which is the Water Community Action Network. And we're using citizen science to build water activism across South Africa. So I'm not sure if people um, know much about South Africa, but um, one of the key motivating factors to build and develop water can and citizen science action um, was or is the state of South Africans, South Africa's water. I've put up a slide um, of pictures that shows the the state of our water at the moment and the pictures are ones we've taken in the field so the one on the left is a manhole a sewage manhole that's overflowing the one in the middle is acid mine drainage that has come to the fore and then the the third one of course is eutrophication at a dam um so just basic things on our water and a state of our water we're a water scarce country so um, we will not have enough water supplies to meet the demand by 2025. About 90% of our water has been allocated already, whether it's to agriculture, um, 
farming, well, agriculture, uh, industry, uh, residential, etc. Also, we have a high level of leakage. I know that the average, the global average is quite high as well, but I think I've got 40% there, but that uh, in red, because that, that figure is outdated. It's about 10 years old, and there's a chance that we lose 50% of our clean water every uh, through uh, being lost through leaking pipes. Our river ecosystems are not in a healthy state and 60% are threatened by climate change, but a lot of it is from human activities, as I've shown you. And 52% of our drinking water supply systems, whoops, range from medium to critical risk. That is just a quick snapshot of South Africa. We are working with uh, a range of people to, to, we have a testing kit that looks at uh, particular chem uh, chemical parameters, um, which is chlorine, pH, alkalinity, hardness, but also phosphates, nitrates, nitrites, and importantly, because the biggest polluter in South Africa is uh, at the moment government in terms of sewage. So we have a total coliform uh, test as well as an E. coli plate, a petri film where we test uh, for E. coli in water. And it's tap water, rivers, streams, dams. And we're working with a range of people across South Africa, but recently we're working with a group of young women in rural South Africa. And if you know much about South Africa, you'll know that um, in rural areas, education is sometimes not at the same. You don't have a lot of science teachers. You don't have access to science uh, education. And so we're taking this and building it as both an educative kind of stream around citizen science, but then we want to build the activism. So you test the water and we're saying to them, okay, so the water's bad. What do you do about it? And we're saying we need to work out the steps with these young women on how to make that um, activism. I think um, uh, uh, I think the presenter before me used stewardship and we saying we want to make it activism so that um, Ashley used stewardship. But we saying it should be activism because that is what's needed right now to protect our water resources in South Africa. Two minutes then. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that. Really great to get the, the South African perspective and exciting to hear about the this project. So thank you for being a pop-up speaker. So we do want to open the floor to questions. And I see there are a few here. And I invite all of our speakers to put their <clears throat> cameras on. Uh, let's see. So we have some questions that were answered. The first one I see that's not answered is, do you take into consideration a module about safety? Uh, kids have high energy, but they do not know about safety and risk. And I'll open that to, to any of our speakers. Or I'll direct, I'll go to Ashley first because I'm not sure who it was asked of, but to help facilitate. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's a great question. Our um, and there the way that we lead our program, there's multiple levels, right? So we have the classroom teacher is always with us in the field, and they have um, autonomy to say, you know, this isn't going to work for my students. We try to pre-screen our sites, but something that we have to be really worried about in the Northeast with um, severe rainfall is like flooding and inundation. And so making sure that when we're heading into streams, we're being really cognizant of the forecast. So um, all of our educators have kind of a protocol that they fall like morning of the program to make sure that the site is safe. Um, and then as always, if we arrive somewhere and it is unsafe, we'll, we'll call the program. But um, our educators are really trained on the methods. So making sure that students have three points of contact in a stream. So when they're using a kick net, they have two feet on the ground, they have one, or there's a support system. So just trying to make sure as students are moving through that they're using their body safely in, in a stream that is safe to be in. Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, Sandra or Farrell, do you have a response for that or should I move to the next? Yeah, I think what, what's important is that you should do it with any citizen science project as what you for yeah, you should make a risk assessment and realize what type of risks are, and there are more risks with kids. So then indeed you need to create an environment that, that is safe and, and uh, had that it's just logical thinking, but the, the smaller the kids, the more supervisors you need. And those supervisors, they don't need to be experts on, on that part, but they need to just make sure that they're safe. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. Oh, thank you. Can I just add a little bit from my perspective? I mean, I think that one of the challenges we have is that we have people who live around rivers and streams who cannot swim. 
So that's the one thing going into the, and we don't have nice flowing rivers. They passed flowing, very heavy flowing rivers. And also um, it's about safety to girls going out to the rivers and streams on their own in terms of being attacked or being harassed by people around them. So we've we've worked on a process of you do not go into the rivers and also working in groups. Thank you all for that. Um, the next question is, does anyone validate the data that the kids collect? How are the data um, entering into the actual research? And is that is that a question for me, potentially? It's not directed. I will, I'm going to open it to anyone. It's not directed. This is specifically. Okay, Sandra, did you want to respond? Um, yeah, uh, of course. And again, this is, has nothing to do with just with kids now. I mean, you need to create a sort of validation method for any type of citizen science project. I think what we did, for example, um, with the Schools and Satellites project is we made pictures of the rainfall measurements. So, um, and in the, in the beginning, we even actually did that. We, we manually checked what they uh, actually filled in and what they, um, uh, what the picture says. And then the picture can sometimes help to improve the measurement, but mostly train them to become better. So I think the validation also really lies into the training, making sure that, you, you, that they really know what to do, how to read, how to read the measurements, how to enter the measurements. Um, so that's I had a validation. Part of the validation lies in the training, um, but you need some other other different type of validation methods, like with pictures, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next question: Has anyone published reports that show the community's attitude changes improves due to citizen science? Not sure if we know so, the answer. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Fergo. I don't have in water, Chris. I mean, I have in uh, air pollution that has happened in South Africa. Okay. So, um, in fact, it was a method that was used uh, that came from the United States. It was called the bucket uh, method of testing uh, air quality. And they used a, a 20 liter bucket with specialized bags and a um, bicycle pump where they would take a grab, uh, they would have a grab sample of air and uh, they used, there was quite a bit of reports written on that whole process. And it also changed um, air quality policy in South Africa. So it was quite a useful thing for citizen science that created not only a change in terms of how people viewed where they were and where they were living in terms of the air they were breathing, but also changed policy. Fantastic, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think I'd like to add, actually, we're working on a paper like that. Um, last year, in, in my intern, he researched a project um, which was actually a follow up of that failed project I explained about uh, the rainfall measurements with schools, but we changed to doing rainfall measurements with inhabitants in the city instead of with school children. So it, it didn't become um, an official educational uh, system anymore. Um, but yeah, we are we're writing a paper about that and, and the, but the research is very intensive. So you're you're imagining perhaps that you're doing already research, huh? you're using the citizen science methodology, but then you have to also research the methodology that you're using. Um, so it's a new research in itself almost, which makes that a lot of people don't make time for it. That's why there's a lot, lot less information uh, on it. And then the evaluation is already very hard because how do you test that people actually um, didn't know something beforehand and what did they actually know? How do you find out what they did know and what they gained from the project? It's it's very hard to, to qualify and quantify and both. But yeah, it's possible and, and yeah, we hope to publish one this year, <laughs> but uh, it's work in progress. Awesome, that's that's great. I also put a reference in the, the answer to the question of a publication similar to what uh, Ferio was speaking about with policy changes. Um, question uh, to Ferio, which area of South Africa uh, is uh, is the, your project happening in? Um, so we have projects happening in a few places, but this particular one working in a rural area, because we work in urban areas, uh, but this particular one is in KwaZulu-Natal, 
um, so if people know South Africa, it's very much on the border between um, Drakensberg, which is a mountain range, and uh, Lesotho, which is the country inside of South Africa. Thank you. A question for Ashley. What would you adjust um, of the lesson series to improve the ongoing program based on the lessons learned? Yeah, that is a great question. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I will keep them short. Um, I think one of the one of the pieces that could definitely be improved upon is um, working through the data with students. Um, so sometimes because it is an integration into the formal classroom, you're really limited on time. Um, but I think it's kind of if the students leave the field and just have all those numbers, it's really not that meaningful if they don't understand the implications um, and the next steps from there. So I think that's a big area. And then I think moving into that component around um, stewardship and action and activism, I really like that Freel shared, um, framed it that way. I think that's really valuable. Um, but yeah, and I think it really could be you could tailor the program to your spe specific geographic region and focus on the parameters that are most valuable. So, you know, the water quality issues in the Northeast are going to be different than potentially other places across the globe. So maybe picking the few parameters and really um, making sure you have a tight quality control and quality assurance on those few parameters um, to make it more specific. Thank you, Ashley. Um... I see a question for Farrell, um, a junior hydrogeologist from Bangladesh. I have a question, how to detect the water quality in rural areas uh, with the lower cost or within lower cost? So the test kit that we're using is, uh, is quite, is, is, it's cheaper than most test kits that we've, we've come across. And we worked with a laboratory within our country to um, find us the best, um, strips etc that that we can afford and use so we've we've we have a testing kit that um has six of every parameter and so you could test once once a month for six months and it costs about oh i don't know dollars um it's two thousand rand so i would say divide by 20 and that's how much it costs um for six tests Thank you very much. Um, what is the biggest challenge in your view about the implementation of citizen science in your projects? For, for, for all in five seconds, I'm gonna to go to Sandra because we only have two more minutes. So your quickest answer. Ooh, the biggest challenge. <laughs> uh, uh, I think to answer whether the citizen science methodology is actually uh, the, the, the methodology you need. I think a lot of people forget that question before they decide that they would just want to do it with citizen science methodology. But I mean, the, the, there's so many challenges. I, uh, but I would say the biggest challenge is often that people forget that one, you know, and then if you don't immediately, because it, it, it if you answer what is your goal, why do you want to implement citizen science? Is it because it's going to make it really easy <clears throat> for you? Uh, or is it because you just want to, you know, use it as an educational tool or something? And, and often I think that if you start doing that, you forget you 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 get the idea that that's a good idea, but then in the end you uh, turn out that uh, the data becomes useless, and then you told all the citizens that you're going to um, collect uh, data that's going to be used, and then you cannot tell them how it's used because it was worthless. And then yeah, you see, it's like it becomes a circle. So that's the thing. Thank you, thank you, Sandra. So just to, stay, to keep us on time, I want to thank all of you as our speakers, super helpful, really great interaction with the audience. Thanks for all your questions. And a reminder that we are on US Eastern time zone for next week. This US changes clocks this weekend. So next week, our webinar will be one hour earlier in places that are not springing forward this weekend, 1700 hours in, in, um, in Europe and adjusted wherever you are, if you are changing clocks or not. So thank you. Have a, a great week. We look forward to seeing many of you again next week and having your participation. And again, thanks to our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.